what we would like to tell you today and what we, use, what we think that you will take home today. Uh, we are from the Linux for Space, focused on CubeSats, and we would like to talk about how to survive in space when there is a fault, and how this relates to Linux in space. And as a reference, uh, stay till the end, because in the second half of my talk, this guy will raise up and uh, he will introduce you a uh, Linux-based uh, really successful computer. And uh, yeah, we would like to learn you what you shall keep in mind if you are thinking about sending Linux to space. Uh, personally, I'm Lenka kosková Čísková from Technical University in Liberec, and we do run Linux for Space with my colleague Lukáš Mazl here. We do run uh, the Linux for Space uh, project there, and Tomáš Novotný will introduce himself. <laughs> I'm from uh, Czech Aerospace Research Center. Yeah, he, yeah, because I always make faults when I try to say the name of his institution in English. Okay. Uh, so, shortly to the Linux for Space, we have been presenting this several times. So, we are focused to CubeSats, because if you say space, everybody thinks about a rocket, but actually space is not a rocket science. Uh, so, what you see on the right side is a real satellite made by Thomas and his friends and colleagues, and uh, it's cube because it's based of cubes who are 10 to 10 to 10 centimeters. So, this one has three units. and. Uh, uh, we, we will focus to the Linux use case when Linux is working as so-called payload system on the satellite. You have always something which is called onboard computer, and then you have we call it payloads. I mean the scientific experiments or the other computers. So not the most critical one. Uh, as you see, there is no human there, so there is no graphical user interface, and on the board there is no user interface at all. But the whole thing shall survive in space. And uh, in Linux for Space, because we originated from Europe, we would like to stay as close to the ESA standards as possible. And uh, the uh, Linux for Space itself is designed to be based on two Yocto layers. Uh, we, during this summer break, we came up with uh, something which we call tool satellite. Actually, it's not a satellite, it's a demo mission based on Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone. And uh, I hope that in the next few days, uh, it will be on our wiki. If you would like to start Linux for space on those two computers, you can do it. So there is the onboard computer, which is uh, the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone plays as the payload. Uh, and we would like to introduce also the ground station later on during this autumn. And uh, now let's go to space. Uh, it's complicated, but not so much. But I would like to point out what you need to keep in mind when you are designing hardware or software working on that hardware stays for Linux. So probably everyone will think about the radiation because it's a big issue, because the radiation can destroy all the electronics you have on board. And due to this fact, uh, these satellites are switching on and off if they are entering the radiation areas. So your Linux shall be ready if it's asked to shut up really, really fastly. Then uh, there are big temperature issues because yes, there is not so much hot in space unless you're facing the sun because there is no air, there is no cooling. So you constantly come from overheating to be completely frozen, which is issue for the hardware and then it's issue for your software as well. The other, maybe not so visible point here, is that uh, when you are going to space, you are facing really heavy vibration, and you need to be ready for that. So maybe think about placing the SD cards to your satellite. It can survive. We have seen that in our history, uh, but depends uh, how much you want to risk. Yeah, the problem is also that you are remote, and you are really, really remote. I mean, it's far, far away, and you can't communicate with your satellite the whole day. You have a dedicated amount of minutes per day when can, you can fix something really operating the device using, the, using some kind of low bandwidth, slow communication, but all these satellites are operated by human operator. And also, uh, it's pretty expensive, so you don't want to have some troubles. 
Uh, when, uh, in last two years, as we started the Linux for Space, we had a lot of discussions with the people who are designing these satellites, and these are based on the research we did also during this summer, is that the biggest challenge is the radiation to protect yourself and your system. The limited cooling is really, really big issue. And the last one uh, is also the power consumption. And here we probably shall mention that uh, the most critical part of your mission is, uh, is when you get launched from the rocket and the satellite is uh, going randomly around and you need to set your device to face the sun to have the energy. And you can very suddenly be off energy at all. And you just need to pray that something will force your satellite to face the sun again. Uh, so these are, let's say, the challenges we see there. And if we will go back here, I, I'm the first one who talks because I'm from academia and theory comes first. So here's a few just, let's say, cherry picking from the whole fault tolerance system design. So just to set up the abbreviations and everything. Uh, I mean, as a fault tolerance, we understand that the system can, can detect that there was a fault and can survive it somehow. Uh, and be uh, go back to the operation. Uh, the fault can come from the software or hardware. We are in the Linux, so I'm just mentioning the software. The physical environment is pretty making a lot of troubles to you in space. And also, you can be overloaded, overheated, whatever. So the failures may come from the, or the fact you're operating there. Uh, and uh, you will, if you would like to, let's say, Google for those topics, then you need to Google for uh, fault detection, isolation, or recovery techniques. And there is, it's, I mean, if you are working in the embedded industry in some really reliable and safe, you, prob you probably heard it. Uh, based on uh, the published works, uh, the most problematic part in CubeSat are those SOCs which we are using at. Uh, uh, as the, uh, for the computers. I forgot to mention probably the buzzword. Yeah, the new space buzzword. Uh, because the, when the whole space stuff started, uh, all the systems were designed to be 100% reliable. I mean, for the first Apollo and those missions, everything was perfectly tested because you had really just one trail and it costed a lot of money. But these days, uh, something which is called new space, and especially in the, uh, in the CubeSat, people are using normal hardware you can buy on Amazon, and they simply try to send it to space. Because to build up a CubeSat and launch it, it's not so expensive as build up a big, heavy satellite. I mean, it's 100 times cheaper. And sometimes it's even better to do the first trial and learn, and second one and learn, and third one and learn, then just to try to make it perfect and spend all your money uh, doing these fault tolerance analysis and uh, all those preparations. So this is, in the CubeSat world, uh, we, people are working with a little bit different approach compared to, let's say, the, the big heavy space stuff. So, since Apollo, the space engineers are uh, running those failure mode analysis, and as I said, okay, you don't have to do everything what you, are, what you have seen, let's say, for those uh, Mars missions and stuff like this, but to have at least kind of this table in your preparation phase is pretty smart. I mean, uh, how it works, you, you are for, you are identifying the possible failures, so you think what can possibly get wrong, and how critical the error is, or how, how severe it is for you, I mean, if it will destroy the mission, or if you can go on, and uh, what is the probability when it can appear. So, uh, after some negotiation in your team, you end up with a table like this, and in those uh, uh, squares, you will have those failures which you expect, and then you will think, how can you move to, let's say, the yellow and even more to green? How can you improve your system to avoid yourself to appear in those red parts? So we will show you how it's done. Oh, sorry. Uh, mostly it's done by redundancy. As you see, we are three speakers here. <laughs> so we are ready. <laughs> we analyzed this problem and we did something. So mostly, 
from the hardware point of view, you will see a lot of uh, duplicities or even triplicities. We will talk about it. So you have, for the critical systems, you keep two of them or three of them and you are reading the outputs and voting, uh, deciding which of your systems is uh, working the best way. But, again, plenty of, uh, let's say, the theory or the recommendations were written for uh, those big CubeSat, uh, which are the billions of euros. So in the CubeSat uh, world, you will keep the case, I mean, keep it simple and stupid because it works. So as you see what we find out in some study, 43% of CubeSat are done let's, the way, let's try and we will see. Uh, why uh, doubling? By the way, it's a big issue in CubeSat because it's so small and it has so limited energy that sometimes you cannot double the stuff because you have no space and you have no power to have this duplicity. Here is an example how it works in the real life and that's uh, why as an embedded Linux designer shall think about it because as you see, I, I, I guess this is quite a typical setup that you have two CPUs, one uh, is a backup for the other one, uh, you have data flash uh, which is dedicated and the NOR flash, uh, uh, this uh, auto was made in Finland, I am linking to the article so you can read it in detail. So you have uh, two flashes for kernel and bootloader, and then you have uh, two NAND flashes, and each of those NAND flashes contains two images of the file system. So uh, you have, uh, everything is nearly doubled, and maybe even, I don't know how to say it with Latin, so four times you have it there. And uh, for the, for example, from point of view of Linux, uh, there is a ECC kernel driver which uh, protects the data in the NAND flash. Uh, uh, so you can be, let's say, a little bit more sure uh, that uh, your data are not corrupted. And for the memories and for everything, there are checksums implemented and uh, a lot of other stuff. The most critical part is when you are rebooting. Uh, theoretically, but you will hear, uh, hear it from Thomas that this is the theory. Theoretically, uh, you will be forced to reboot uh, and then during the boot process, you are kind of vulnerable. And uh, so there are several ways. So typically you have, as I showed you, uh, duplicity in uh, the, those uh, memories from which you are loading first the bootloader, secondary the uh, kernel image, etc. So mostly you will see that this sophisticated way uh, mentioned here, so, uh, and you will see it in Thomas' uh, example, the real life one. But we have also met a team who simply placed two SD cards on their, uh, and, okay, let's try the primary one three times, and if it fails, let's try the other one, and repeat this procedure. I mean, the satellite is operating. Both of those approaches uh, uh, are working in space, so it's up to you how much risk you would like to take, and how much money you would like to invest uh, to be kind of uh, secure of failures. Yeah, uh, in the space we have over the vacuum update and uh, <laughs> as we learned in uh, described and available examples, mostly I would guess that in 90% at least uh, people are updating the binaries. But Sometimes uh, the connection is pretty, uh, it's uh, slow and you have limited amount of time. So probably maybe the upload will fail. So you need to be sure that you're implementing in your bootload, uh, booting procedure and also uh, your software need to check that it was really uploaded correctly because um, the pessimistic way of implementation is a good one here. Yeah. So mostly uh, people are updating binaries to space uh, or sometimes partial binary, and we also discussed with someone that they are uploading uh, patches and compiling on the board. Uh, because the patch is small, and you are just uh, touching the piece of sources. The problem here is that uh, if you are updating binaries, you can have the copy of uh, the machine on the, on the ground, and you can test it and compare it. But this is also possible. Again, the connection is slow, and it, this is tricky. How it's with the standards? Okay, there are plenty of them. I tried to, so if you would like to sell your satellite to ESA, 
or and it's the same for NASA, just different abbreviations here. You see there is a plenty of analysis you shall do, fault tree analysis, the, this mecha analysis, hazard, software integration analysis, and there are plenty of quality standards related to it. And uh, in those standards, uh, typically there are workflow described, etc., etc., and it's uh, huge. But for CubeSats, it's mostly too complex. You can, what's important that you need to know that you can go to space if you will ignore what's above. But if I shall select for you something which is kind of relevant, this Savora F. Diver handbook from SA uh, uh, was, the work started in 2019 and it tries kind of summarize to you how do the FDR uh, correctly for space and maybe this is the best uh, place where to start if you want to get familiar with that and uh, yeah they have five steps so you need to analyze the system uh, requirement then you need to have some concept definitions uh, you need to think about the high level architecture design then you run the FMECA and FMEA analysis and uh, then you implement and here is just uh, listed uh, how we label the criticality of the failures. So the worst one is the unrecoverable. I mean, the satellite stopped operating and it's not answering to anything. Or um, you can restart your component or whatever. Okay, so now it's time for Thomas and his satellite. Uh, thank you, Lenka, for the introduction. Uh, I will talk about uh, our satellites uh, or our hardware, and uh, we will see uh, some technical de details. Uh, uh, first of all, we had a talk last year, uh, and we were talking about Vizetaliusat 2. Uh, I will talk uh, about it uh, here just briefly. Uh, the key point there is that there are two Linux computers, uh, the satellite is orbiting for two and a half years now, and we don't see uh, any issue with the Linux computers. Uh, we thought that we, will, we, that we will be forced to, for example, format uh, the flash, but it's not the case. The file system which was uh, prepared uh, two and a half years ago is still working, which is, which is a kind of surprise for us, but we are happy with it. Uh, of course, the memories uh, which are there are uh, automotive grade, they have ECC and uh, everything in place, but they, they work. Uh, the primary mission of this uh, satellite is Earth observation. There are like five or six other scientific payloads. So I asked our operator if we have a photo of Vienna. Do you think that we hit the conference? The place where the conference is. So yes, we were lucky. <laughs> Obviously, our satellite likes the places where the conferences are because last year we had the Prague. <laughs> uh, now we have Vienna. So Linux Foundation, great job. Not, not just because this photo, of course, because of the famous Wiener Schnitzel in Kartoffelsalat. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so, but let's go ahead uh, with the fault tolerance. Uh, that was a satellite which was based from the COTS components or some low-cost space grade components and it works. Uh, we are preparing our own Linux computer. Uh, we presented uh, it last year only very briefly because last year it was in a very early stage of the development. Uh, now the computer is ready. It looks like this. So it's uh, CubeSat form factor 10 by 10 centimeters and it's based on pre-selected uh, commercial of the shelf uh, components. Uh, what about target, uh, target applications? Uh, it can be payload controller because it has plenty of power and on Linux it's easy to run Python, any algorithms, OpenCV, etc. which is real benefit for the scientists. Uh, it can be also the data handling subsystem because we have uh, ability to connect SSD on the bottom side. So we have uh, plenty of gigabytes 
of memory, which is also nice. And it can be attitude determination and control system because it has plenty of interfaces. And for uh, ADCS, you need a lot of sensors and actuators. Uh, this is everything, uh, th this, all of this is possible just uh, because the nature of Linux. You have the versatility, uh, which is really cool. But one thing is missing. We don't treat our computer as an onboard computer, which is the really mission critical uh, computer on the satellite. Uh, in the meantime, in the last year, we did uh, several tests. Uh, we did a thermal vacuum cycling. I will talk about it later. Uh, we did the vibration tests. Uh, we did a lot of functional tests. There were many sensors connected, many actuators, many communications were done. And on the component level, I mean on memories, uh, etc., we have a radiation test. So we know that the components will survive at least two years in space. We would like to qualify uh, hold the computer uh, at the beginning of next year. Uh, thanks to the test we did and we passed, uh, it's already, uh, this computer is part of uh, several missions. I am really excited about the Visa Talusa 3 mission. Uh, there will be twins and they will try to approach together, uh, approach, uh, uh, yes, together, and uh, uh, make a video of, of, this, of this approach. And there will be uh, like uh, four computers uh, on these uh, satellites, four Linux computers on these satellites. Uh, Corus, another mission where it will be used and we will also use it for stratospheric, stratospheric flights. So, let's talk about the fault, fault mitigation. Uh, Lenka, already, uh, Lenka already said something about the analysis. Uh, I would say, try it, do it, because it's uh, really, you will see uh, your mission and the problems in the table in a nice way. Just sit with your engineers and uh, assess the probability and severity of problems you, you, might, you might face. Uh, because you will see that as there are mechanical guys, electronics guys, software guys, uh, ground segment guys, there is a lot of people and you will see how they are confident about their part. So you will see really on the table what's the problem and then you can mitigate the risk and you will focus only what the real problem is. You won't hunt something which is not, not important. So if there is uh, something out of your analysis, you should start uh, avoiding, typically avoiding single point of failures. The first point is uh, really nice regarding Linux. Uh, this is a real, uh, real scenario from our, one of our missions because we had a small but very reliable space grade sensor and we connected it to the Linux computer. Uh, so there was a package, this is blue rectangle, and it was handling, handling this, this sensor. But this computer was not that uh, reliable as the sensor, so we identified that there is a, a, single point of, a single point of failure. Luckily, there was another computer for a different purpose. These are these green and red boxes on the, on the satellite. And that backup, backup computer was a Linux, so, we did a, just a copy of that laptop package to that computer. And the only thing we did was to connect a new cable for it. Luckily, that sensor had uh, two interfaces. So we just, from the hard hardware point of view, we just added the cable and we have the redundancy in the functionality, which is really cool uh, because it was fast and cheap. And it was done on the Linux computers. Uh, if you have enough money, uh, enough space, enough power, you can uh, use the typical method, which is cross-trapping. I think you know it all, all of you. Uh, nominal in this uh, terminology means uh, that the nominal is the main computer which should do the work normally. If there is a problem, there is a redundant computer. So the cross-trapping, everything is connected. If you like, if you like cabling, this is a way to go. So. <coughs> but it's not usually the case for the, for the CubeSats. 
Uh, another very nice approach, uh, I saw in a presentation last year, uh, it was from guys from Fraunhofer, uh, there is the image of their computer. Uh, they basically duplicate their computer because uh, they wrote their mission and in the heart of the mission there was a Linux computer. And there were many things connected to the computer and they said, okay, if this, if this will fail, we are totally doomed. So they decided to take two of these computers and they put a switch in between, so, uh, and switch and supervisor. So the supervisor was turning on or off only one computer at a time and they were uh, multiplexing all the buses up or down. So it was a bigger box, you can see, it's like three of these boxes on top, but there was a redundancy inside that, that computer. Uh, there is a link in the presentation, so you can check. It's really nice, nice presentation. And uh, thanks to the uh, thing that we are not the onboard computer, uh, we are not forced to run all the time. So it's really a wise idea to turn off uh, if we are not necessary to run. It saves you power and you will survive more time. <laughs> So you are more susceptible to, uh, uh, to radiation effects if you are turned on. So it's lame, but uh, it's, it really works. Uh, okay, if, by the way, if I'm talking about system level, I'm talking about satellite. If I'm talking about subsystem level, I'm talking about the component, about the computer. And by the way, there is also mission level, which means the ground segment and satellite or satellites. So it's a mission, system, subsystem. Uh, so, about, so what about the fault mitigation on the subsystem level, on the computer itself? Uh, it's quite a lot about the hardware, about the design, about the production, about the testing. Yes, we are a new space, it's cheap, but it's not that cheap, so you really test it. There is a lot of tests, we, we are, uh, we are undergo. Uh, the talk last year covered it uh, in, a, in a detail. So just only in, in, a, in a brief what, what we are testing. Uh, there are thermal testing. I will talk about it later. There are mechanical tests like shock and vibration. Uh, there are radiation testing. There are two main parts. How long it will survive until it will degrade or does it survive the high energy particle because it causes reboot. Uh, there is a lot of functional tests, short and long term, day in the life, with, connector sen with connected sensors, etc. Uh, also, this is uh, this is seen in the in the other industries that we should test uh, with subsystem as early as possible because you will find a lot of errors when you are connecting things together, which is integration hell, you know, most probably. And of course, all the tests you can repeat on system, subsystem, component level. So we are trying to do uh, the respective test on the respective levels, but sometimes it's duplicated on, on more levels. So what about the thermal vacuum testing? Uh, on the images, uh, this is our thermal vacuum chamber. Uh, it's really cool to have your own thermal vacuum chamber because as you can see on the, on the, on the plot, there is a X axis and it's in hours, which means that we were testing this device more than 300 uh, hours. And there were three more tests, I just cut it. And there were two runs of these tests. So it's, uh, it was roughly 1000 hours in, in the thermal vacuum chamber. So it's quite a lot. And the Linux computer was turned on sometimes, I will talk about it. Uh, these temperatures are from the reference point on the structure, not on the CPU. The temperature on the CPU is uh, higher. It reaches sometimes about, uh, it reaches uh, 80 degrees uh, Celsius because uh, there is a problem with cooling. So it's, the temperature is really high, but this is uh, from, the, from the thermal vacuum chamber. The pressure there is uh, similar to what's in space uh, or it's representative enough. Uh, I put the conversion table for our friends from uh, America, etc. Uh, regarding the plot, 
So there is a, at the beginning, there is a non-operating cycle where you can see that we are reaching uh, plus 60 degrees and minus 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, we don't turn on the computer at that point because this is only the servability temperature. We just need to ensure that nothing will break or destroys. And then there is the first uh, longer term test that the computer is, is on for its mission uh, for, for its mission time and we are testing uh, the communication, the performance and all these things. And after this long term test, when we, when we know the performances of the computer, we are switching to functional tests when we are uh, every two or three hours turning on the computer, do the test, shutting it down and uh, do it again, again, again in the, in this, uh, in this spikes. Uh, there is an access to the thermal vacuum chamber. There are through hole connectors so we can, uh, we can have can or power connection inside the, inside the thermal vacuum chamber, but the pressure is still the same. So we cannot open the, the chamber. Okay. Uh, there are some design principles we did in, for our computer. Uh, a disclaimer, it seems to work for us. We will see uh, after the flight tests. Uh, I will be happy if you tell me that there is a problem because I have a time to fix it before the launch. Uh, so the first design principle is it should be autonomous but dump. It was really difficult for me because I was always trying to make, make it clever and self-healing, etc. But our system engineer said, nope, nope, nope. Just leave it for the operator. Because there is so many things which can go wrong, you cannot think of. So don't focus on something you think it, will, it might happen. Just make it simple. Uh, so the only design principle in this simplicity is really try hard to boot to Linux. And then wait for command. And that command might be from the onboard computer, which is on satellite, so there, there is some autonomous handling, or from an operator. But you have a really limited time, limited time for the operator. Uh, there is a simplified U-boot flow. Uh, I hope it's readable. I will talk, ab talk about it in the next slide, but there is a, just for, for information. Uh, the examples of the autonom autonomicity is that we are iterating through boot images, as Lenka said, uh, we are not starting the services automatically. There are scripts prepared on the device. There are uh, uh, services prepared, that, but they are don't start it. They, you are waiting for the command from outside. And we are not automatically powering on the external storages, external components. A lot of components are power gated. There are load switches uh, to to. Uh, protect the, the components which are, uh, which are behind because the component can make a problems or energy spikes. So we are not turning them automatically. We just wait for the uh, command. Uh, we said that we will minimize the writes to non-volatized memories because the writes can corrupt the memory uh, and it's, it seems to save operate only in RAM. By the way, it's usually a, f uh, a requirement from ESA, so maybe it's something more behind. And we are duplicating uh, everything. So, what about the configuration of U-Boot and Linux and how we did, did it? Uh, first of all, we are not touching the source code, mainly because we <laughs> don't have uh, time and budget to do the proper analysis, but it seems to work. So we are really playing with the configuration and we are also trying to rely or we are relying on what is used by the most of the users. Uh, it's the tested uh, really well. The build, the build is handled by Yocto uh, and we are trying to have uh, everything in Yocto, all the source codes or the configuration because it's really, really nice when you see at the end that you have one binary and you have the traceability, uh, you have the knowledge what's, what's, what's inside. 
so it really uh, it's nice uh, use case for Yoto or any build any other build system. Just just put everything to the build system. It really pays off. So what about the boot? Uh, something about the the boot uh, the boot procedure. At the beginning, uh, the environment from uh, the memory is loaded, and during the mission, there should be only the default environment, which is part of your boot. This is this uh, script, which uh, I will explain. There is a chance if there will be a bug, a problem, or something will go really wrong, we have an option to put another environment to a specific part of the memory, and then we can continue according to the new environment. I hope I won't use it throughout the whole mission, but this is the safety net we have there. Uh, the next thing which is done is our recovery, recovery procedure. Uh, so during the boot, uh, we will test uh, if there is a recovery flag, flag set or not. If it's set, it means that we, are, uh, we were trying to boot the standard procedure. So if it is set, we will directly go to the recovery boot. And if it, it wasn't set, it means that uh, we will set it and we are most probably in the first uh, boot. This uh, procedure is there because if we will see any error, we will uh, reboot automatically and this safety net will trigger the recovery, recovery Linux. So the first thing is, to, the, the, another thing is to set the recovery flag and then we are trying the scripts. Uh, there are several, sev several, several uh, options to, uh, to use the scripts. There might be anything in the script. You may try to fix something in FPGA or you can um, manipulate the memory or you can uh, boot your slot. It, it depends on you. Uh, so it tries uh, whatever you want. And then if there are no scripts, uh, it will try to boot the first slot, second, etc. And then it will find, it will try the recovery slot. So this is the, this is the uh, logic behind. So we are, we are reaching end. Uh, something about Linux. As I said, uh, it's built by Yocto, and I'm happy to have Yocto here because uh, the Yocto really excels in the, uh, in the manageability of the source code because we have uh, various layers. We have the layer for the computer, we have a layer for the use case, uh, we have a layer with the mission, so it nicely fits uh, one top, uh, on top of the other, so it's uh, really nice to, to handle. Uh, there are package groups defined, and out of these package groups, we are creating nominal and recovery image, which are then flashed to the, to the real hardware. Uh, as I said earlier, the nominal Linux is uh, trying to reboot itself on any error you will, you will encounter, and the uh, U-boot logic will handle it by the recovery fl flag, so it will directly run the recovery Linux and tries to recover the system on the operator basis. Uh, I'm running out of the time, so I will go quickly to the end. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We will tr do our best to answer it. Yeah. I have a curiosity question. What is the bound rate, the speed with which you can communicate with the satellite? You mentioned it's slow, but how slow? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> it's terribly slow. Uh, the packet loss at the beginning of the mission is uh, maybe more than 50, uh, 50% uh, because you usually need to uh, align the ground segment and the satellite and uh, define the gain of the antenna. There is a lot of things you cannot uh, test in advance. In advance. And uh, with Visatelusat 2, we have 9.6 kilobytes. We have only UHF, which is a really slow uh, radio. Uh, for the upcoming mission, we will have only downlink, which is fast, and it will be roughly 
10 megabits per second, but only 20 minutes of a day. So it's really, really uh, dependent on the radio's uh, coverage of your ground station. So it heavily depends on the mission, but it's uh, terribly slow usually. So for your sample satellite you're building, what's the uh, interconnect between the payload and the flight computer? Uh, for the commanding, it's usually CAN. We were trying I2C on the Vizetelusat 1, and it's not good if you are out of the PAN PCB. If you are going through these connectors, which are stacked, it's terrible for I2C. Uh, so we, we like CAN. And for uh, high speed connections, we are using, uh, we are now trying Ethernet, LVDS, and there is a space wire which is kind of LVDS. For Vizetaliusat 2, the price for our research institute, uh, I think we paid like, I don't know how much exactly, but I know that the launch cost was 10% of our budget. Uh, it was in uh, two years ago, it, it cost, the launch costed uh, 100,000 euros, roughly. But it's getting cheaper every year with SpaceX, it's crazy. And there will be much more providers in three, four years. OK? Thank you very much. Right, okay.